All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy spring forward. You guys are troopers coming in at 10 a.m., which is really 9 a.m. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I am Z, like the letter. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of organizing the panels that are happening in this room yesterday and today. And I want to thank the sponsor, Advanced Technology International, ATI, uh, who is not only sponsoring this session, but all the sessions that happened in here yesterday, as well as all the sessions that will happen later today. You'll see some QR codes out in the, the room on the way out the door uh, that uh, you can actually scan, and that'll give you access to the rest of the programs. And a few days after South By's over, you'll see the recordings for all of these sessions posted there. So anything that you might have missed yesterday uh, or that you might not be able to make today due to all the other fantastic sessions going on, uh, you'll be able to get access to. Um, we also have a happy hour happening tonight around 5 o'clock uh, featuring a really innovative program called the Defense Business Accelerator, so uh, more on that later. Um, but uh, without further ado, you are here for Made in America, What's It Worth? And let me welcome, uh, join me in welcoming up the panelists for that session. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Peters. I'll be moderating the uh, session today. We have Deborah Dahl, Mark Schaefer. Uh, very fortunate. This is going to be a very interesting conversation, I think. And, and it's just the three of us, so this is going to be more like an open dialogue. We're going to go through and talk for a while. Uh, and then about 20 minutes before we uh, wrap up, we'll open up for questions from uh, the audience. Uh, as Z said, the title for this is Made in America, What's It Worth? And it's really about... How do, we, how do we shift mindsets for individuals, for companies, for the government, from one of low cost to being able to focus on resilience or sustainability or agility or something else aside from just low cost? I'm really excited about having these two here with, with, uh, with us today. So Deborah Dahl is uh, a leading uh, thought, uh, thought leader in supply chains, um, Mark is a, he's one of the top marketing strategists in the country. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy about um, talking to these two and then especially having this conversation is they're both visionary, but they're both very passionate, which I'm sure will come out very quickly in this conversation. Um, they're just, they're, they're, um, they're gonna be a, a, great, a great voice for this discussion. I typically do not read um, bios. So please go to the website, take a look at their bios. They're very impressive. But what I like to do is I like to get a little bit of insight into them, maybe something that a lot of people don't know that gives us a little bit more um, insight into what they may be thinking or where they're coming from. So Deborah, I'm going to start with you. And so one of the things I learned from you is that when you're traveling, one of the things you like to do when you go into a new city is Walk the grocery store aisles. Why? What are you getting out of that? Does anyone else like doing this? Does it? Thank you. Okay. It, all right. It's a thing. So it's for a, thing. a quarter of you, I don't have to explain. Listen, I know that part of travel is going to museums and the big landmarks and whatever it is that the guidebooks tell us to, but I find I learn more about a city by the aisles of the grocery store than any other way. I was in a grocery store in Ghana once, and there were 16 flavors of ketchup. Why, why were there? Uh, so we learn a lot. And one of my favorite <clears throat> self-soothing activities to do if I've had a bad day is to walk up and down every single aisle <laughs> in the grocery store. So it's something we all do. It's something we all share. Everybody goes to the grocery store or the market in some way. We all have to eat. Uh, and it's one of the most unifying places, I think, that we have across cities. And I really, I really enjoy it. Huh. I, I do know a few other people that do that. But I was just really curious what you got out of it. It seems like everybody gets a little bit something different. And, and then Mark, so. I'm feeling anxiety right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yours, so you're an apiarist uh, or a beekeeper. Yes. And you've actually won a blue ribbon at the Tennessee State Fair, is that right? I did. You know, Why uh, bees? Well, uh, you know, I remember like, when I was a child uh, playing in the grass, there's bees everywhere, you know, in the clover. Yeah. And I was working in my yard, I live in Tennessee, and uh, I, know, I saw a honeybee. And I thought, I can't remember the last time I saw a honeybee. And it turns out there's a bee crisis in the world. So I've got some, some land that I wasn't doing any, anything with, and I went to the local beekeepers, and just purely for environmental reasons, 
I said, you know, do you want to put some bees? They said, this is a perfect place for bees. See, because it's mellow, right? And that's why the bees make such good honey. <laughs> Nobody, did, nothing disturbs them. So, so I didn't even know this. The, 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 like the beekeeper in the county took our honey and submitted it. And we won the blue ribbon the first, first year. Yeah, we won the blue ribbon in the state fair for our honey. So what kind of music do you play for the bees? I sing. Uh, you sing? Yeah. And they still make good honey, huh? They do. <laughs> All right. So listen, let's get, let's get down to the, the subject here. So, you know, over the how many, however many years, we've had this real focus on cost. So we've offshored so much starting back in the 70s, especially in the 80s. Let's talk a little bit about how we got here. And then let's talk about what we need to do to move forward. But as far as how we got into the situation, Deborah, maybe if you can start off, give us a little bat, bit of background from your perspective. Sure how thing. did we get here? Um, I love to figure out how we ended up where we are today. Um, and I can go down uh, Google adventures on these topics. Um, but the idea of uh, outsourcing started actually in the mid 1800s in Great Britain as accounting systems were really, really complicated and not everybody could afford or find this type of talent. Uh, so it came with a combination of outside resourcing, outsourcing, uh, and went to businesses that have become the Deloitte and PwC of today. Now fast forward uh, more than 100 years into the 1970s and uh, General Electric started a center of excellence in India. Uh, and they concentrated a lot of their best practices, their black belt Six Sigma, or Six Sigma black belt talent. And eventually, as they discovered uh, the benefit across their business units, they thought, shoot, we might have a business idea here. And in the early 2000s, spun that center out into a company called Genpact, which is where I work in my day job today. And we run some of the largest uh, outsourced supply chain as a service uh, operations in the world. Now, if we go to the 80s, this is the, probably what we all have in our minds as we're thinking about manufacturing, and this is where uh, offshoring really started to pick up speed. Uh, fast forward to the 2001, China joined the WTO, which really opened up their labor market to the rest of the world. Uh, what's interesting to me, too, is that in 1988, not long after the first offshore factories opened, uh, Harvard Business Review ran an article that said, manufacturing offshore is bad for business. And so almost as soon as we've offshored, there's been this contingency to reshore. Uh, and here we are today, and we'll talk about and unpack why now. I started looking at reshoring in the context of my research, which we'll, we'll talk about, which comes at it from almost a polar opposite of nationalist perspectives, um, which I'm totally okay with. But as I started to research why would we want to create an item closer to the user, uh, I was told <clears throat> by those who have been in the business longer that, uh, oh, we've been talking about reshoring for the last decade, you know, it's, it's never going to happen, yada, yada, but it is happening. And so it's exciting to see some of the catalysts that are making that shift uh, and having companies really take this quite seriously. And by the way, I noticed that when you said those who have been in the business longer, you were looking at me. <laughs> Great, great. She work. also looked over here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Though neither right. of you are the person I had <laughs> yeah. in my mind when telling you. She was looking story. at me for validation, I think, there. <laughs> All right, so, so Mark, I mean, that's some of the business background, but is there something corresponding with consumers, too, that helped drive us to this whole thing of uh, offshoring? Well, you, you know, I, I was thinking about... Uh, you, my, people might be thinking, okay, well, why does he have the marketing guy on the, on the panel? But... You know, one of the things I learned is that you know marketing is just so integrated and and really creating products for consumers and creating customers is so integrated with the with the supply chain and uh, it was such a uh, an amazing opportunity for me when I was a young guy uh, my, one of my first jobs out of college was to work for Alcoa this big company made aluminum and they were making aluminum for packaging and I thought you know, as a consumer, you just think, oh, you know, here's an aluminum can. And if people could actually see the whole supply chain from the dirt to making that aluminum, they would like hold it like a precious jewel. It's like, it, it, it's just like so amazing. And as a, as a B2B marketer, I spent, uh, you know, so much of my time with procurement, with transportation, because getting the products to market um, that's as important, especially in B2B, as creating the, the, the products. Now, you know, one of the things on the consumer side is that there is still a lot of interest in 
made in America, but there's also a lot of confusion about what is made in America. Does that mean it's all made in America? There really haven't been a lot of standards set, at least it's not you know, standards that consumers know. There isn't any sort of like unified banner people would look for to say, oh, this is you know, an, American, uh, you know, an American product. Uh, so, but most, most consumers, and I, I know we're gonna get into this a little bit more later, you know, most consumers, and, and, it's, and it's really even in, across the political spectrum, you know, Republicans or Democrats, you know, no matter what the political belief, it is, there's a, about a 76% saying, I prefer American products. Where the gap is, and I think we'll talk about this later, is age. So baby boomers, 86%, you know, they have a strong preference for made in America. They will pay more for made in America. Uh, Gen Z, it's 42%. Mm. Now, you know, I, I think we have to do some thinking around, is it because they don't care or is it because they're broke and they, and they want to, you know, pay for lower price products? Yeah. You know, so, so we've been in this situation for a long time, but now all of a sudden there's this, this growing resurgence in um, reshoring, bringing a lot of things back, and mm -hmm. growing uh, rise in the made, made in America uh, demand. Why? What's going on now that has changed this? I'll answer half of that, and he can take the <laughs> But the, from everything that I understand, uh, we have a couple of mega trends that are coming together, which is really pushing for companies to reshore, nearshore, or friend shore, depending on the version that you'd like. Uh, one, very clearly, our supply chains are terribly disrupted and disruptable. Uh, we saw that as consumers during COVID for the first time ever, our families called us asking, is that what you do for a living? For those of us who are in supply chain, do we have supply chain people in the room? A couple, cool. Yeah. All right, then I'll explain more about supply chain. Um, so our supply chains are very long today. Through the 1900s and specialization through different countries, uh, governments made very intentional choices to invest in very niche areas. There might be an economic area in a country that specializes in putting zippers on jeans, for example, but not doing the threads or the dyes. So that if you're wearing jeans today, both of you are, they traveled 40,000 miles before you ever put them on. And that's when you add up the denim, the cotton, the dyes, the threads, the buttons, every, all the different components. Uh, your iPhone went 240,000 miles, that's all the way to the moon, when you add up all the different components. And I just learned my new fun fact from Chris yesterday, uh, semiconductor chips cross the border 40 times before it ever goes into a product. 40 times, all the components, everything that goes into that product. So our supply chains are very, very long. Traditionally, ocean freight has been easy to access uh, affordable and pretty straightforward. We didn't really care if we put something uh, on the water for a couple of weeks. And so here we've ended up with these extraordinarily long supply chains because what many people don't realize, I think as consumers, is that it doesn't, our products don't really go from mine to one factory to target. There's usually 10, 15, or 20 factories in between uh, rock, find the mineral, process it, so forth and so on, all the way to where you are. So a t-shirt, is five or six tiers, they're called, so different factories along the way. Uh, and your car was more like 20 tiers between the time you got it and all the way back to the planet. So when we think about uh, when something's in motion, when it's going across a border, how many borders were closed during COVID, all of a sudden the disruptability, I don't know if that's a word, it is today, uh, of our supply chains became illuminated for all of us. And so one part is that we will continue to be disruptable as we have different events occur, which brings to the next uh, mega trend on uh, changing political tides, we'll call it, and national security discussions. So if we're nervous about a certain part of the world, if we see what can happen with political unrest happening now, uh, we start to see large swaths of the world's raw materials in the case of Ukraine, uh, they hold a majority for one of the most important uh, inputs to making chips. And so as we start to imagine, not to mention the majority of the world's wheat and so forth and so on. So we start to imagine as these unrest moments happen that our supply chains also become very disruptable. We also have um, a discomfort into some countries having ownership of making certain components that go into everything that makes our society smart. Uh, referring again to semiconductors here. 
Uh, and then I'd say the fourth one that's related to these is uh, the inability to be self-sufficient. So if something does happen, if push comes to shove, uh, what can America build themselves? What can California build themselves? What can a certain region build themselves? Uh, and maybe we can do that together with f friends like Mexico. Uh, but as we start to imagine the recoverability of reacting to certain events, that spectrum has led to uh, a couple of huge investments by the US government, namely the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, putting in the infrastructure around EVs uh, and other much needed infrastructure investments. If you're ever bored and wanna go YouTube something that's very fun, there's this infrastructure infomercial, I think it was done for one of the late night shows, and it's like a movie trailer for the boring world of infrastructure, it's really entertaining. Um, so that's one, and then the CHIPS Act, of course, around um, trying to bring fabs into America. So. Those are a couple of the megatrends I see. Certainly not on the consumer side. I have a lot of perspectives on the pressure we put on consumers. Yeah. But, but it's, it's the same though, really, because the change isn't necessarily being driven by consumers, but it's being driven by the marketers. And the marketers and the supply chain, you know, and, and I've you know, got enough history to, to, to speak rather authoritatively on this, there really hasn't been a strong connection between marketing and the supply chain until the last five years. All of a sudden, what, is the, what are the number one things affecting business? A pandemic, a war, and a ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal. And all of a sudden, when, as I'm going out there talk, talking to marketing leaders, they're saying, we can't create products. We can't get enough SKUs on our shelf. You know, we have to forget about uh, creating new products, creating new value, creating advertising, creating new customers. Our focus has to be on the supply chain. We can't create products. So it's, from my perspective, from a market perspective, it, 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 it's still sort of, you know, consumers are sort of in a cloud as to where a lot of these things come from and how it happens. But there is a lot of attention now from the marketing department saying we have got to have a more resilient and robust supply chain. Yeah. And Mark, do you think that's going to translate into marketing messages? Do you think consumers are becoming aware enough, sophisticated enough, that they can understand the impact of uh, a shorter supply chain or a more resilient supply chain, and they'll make decisions based on that? Or, you know, you were talking about uh, Xi'an and Timu. Um, is it still going to be driven by just price? Well, I think there's an opportunity. And, and the opportunity is, there's, there's a human story to a shorter supply chain. There's an emotional story to a su shorter supply chain. If you have people making things closer to your town, that means jobs, uh, that means livelihoods, that means more taxes going into parks and schools and healthcare. So I, I, I think there is a great story there. I don't think many companies have embraced that yet. But it, it, it's, it's more than being resilient or it's even resil more about you know, patriotism. There, there, there could be a real human story. And you know, I think the only company that, that I know that did that for a while was Walmart. Right? Walmart did a lot about Buy American and they made a real effort. And I, but I, I think more companies can do that. I think it'll be a natural story as manufacturers try to shorten the supply chain, but it's not a story being told today. It could be. Yeah. So one of the, one of the statistics I was reading, um, there are a couple of different studies that were asking Americans, would you pay more for a product that was produced sustainably? Yeah. And uh, one of the studies, 68% said they would uh, pay $5 more. Some said they'd pay $10 more. So there's an awareness of the need for sustainability. And there's uh, a recognition of the value in that. So that leads into the next part I want to talk about. And one of the things that's great about having Deborah here, she just released a book, uh, Circular Supply Chain. If you haven't read it, it's a, it's a great book. Um, but talk to us about Circular Supply Chain and how that might tie into these issues. Absolutely, there's also a huge say-do gap. So we want to believe that we're good people. Right. 68% <laughs> of us think that we're good people, but we're standing at the shelf. <coughs> I'll do a lot to save 20 cents off whatever it is, you know. Uh, okay, so circularity um, often gets confused with recycling. The recycling economy has had 50 years to prove it's working, and it doesn't for a number of reasons, which we won't talk about today. 
Uh, but the circular economy says, look, we bring on 100 billion tons of materials into our economies every year through our supply chains. Only about 7.5% of that gets another go around the sun. So we put that back into the economy and it gets more than one shot to add value. The rest of it doesn't. The circular economy says that's nuts. We should give the material we've already worked so hard to take through five or 15 or 20 tiers all the way down to you. We should give it more shots, more chances to add value to our economy. And if we do it properly, it'll actually add quite a bit of money to our economies uh, to the tune of four and a half trillion dollars. So there's business models uh, that Uberify everything that we do. So if you think about being able to rent something instead of having to buy it, uh, you've participated in a circular economy. Then there's uh, material science and what we do with material alternatives. So can we redesign our products to be more modular, more repairable? Can we source uh, something that was grown in the earth instead of mined out of, um, from fossil fuel, for example? So there's, a, there's the business models, there's the materials, and then there's the operations. Uh, and that's where we start getting into something like a shorter supply chain. And what, what a circular supply chain says is, there's three principles of the circular economy, let's apply them all in order. And the first one is to actually reduce what we bring into the economy in the first place. So can we get rid of these 240,000 mile long supply chains by eliminating one of the biggest wastes that all supply chain professionals know about, which is transportation. We've just kind of lived with it because that's how the global economy works. So that's where we start thinking about physically shorter supply chains by moving production closer to the point of use. Um, and probably they won't be mega factories like we see today. They'll be more distributed, smaller. They won't need to make quite as much. That's a whole other topic to unpack. But imagine what you need is created closer to where you are. Um, and in the case of something like food, it should feel pretty good that the item that you're eating was actually alive within a reasonable period of time of you eating it. The second one then is to circulate the items that we have already. And this might look like um, pallets that we use throughout our supply chains. It might look like water that we use in our factories. Um, it might look like reusing heat runoff, um, which a lot of the hyperscalers love to do. Uh, in Seattle, there is downtown in the most expensive real estate you could possibly imagine, there is a nice little biosphere Jeff Bezos has put in with exotic plants from all over the world. That's kept warm by heat runoff from AWS servers. So that's one example of this idea of circulating resources. The third principle then says, uh, if we do all of this properly, we have a chance to regenerate the world around us. Small plug here, the sustainability, we're actually a little bit too late to be engaging in the concepts of sustaining the way that we are working today. We already use more than one planet per year to sustain current life on the planet and most of the world hasn't even had a chance to experience what middle class looks like. So as the middle class grows, which is important and good to do and more people live longer and we have more thinkers trying to help solve the world's biggest problems, uh, we're gonna be pulling more and more resources out of the planet unless we can pull it from what we've already detached. So this idea of regenerating the planet, leaving it better than the way that we found it, uh, might look like investing in kelp forests. It might look like investing in better materials. Uh, it might look like investing in the communities that we operate in. But across these three principles of uh, eliminating the idea of waste, circulating resources, and regenerating around our operations, we start to imagine what a circular supply chain could look like. So if we get back to this idea of uh, will consumers pay more, we've proven over and over again in different studies that they actually don't. Uh, but I will take this moment to also give my somewhat unpopular opinion that uh, I think we put too much pressure on consumers to say thou shalt demand multi-billion dollar companies to change their ways. Uh, which just doesn't seem quite fair because none of us asked to be in the economy that we're in today, uh, which has essentially been 100 years perfecting this idea of a linear economy where we don't get very high quality products. Uh, all of us probably imagine a time that our items just at lasted longer and they just don't last as long anymore. And that's by design. That is a choice made by companies. Uh, in order to balance what you'll pay and the amount of items they can sell to you. And that entire concept started 100 years ago, and that really gave rise to today's economy. So I think it's a cop-out, and I want to say borderline unethical, for, for us all to sit around saying, oh, you consumers put pressure on a system that you never opted into in the first place. So I actually think, to your earlier question, 
will consumers care? I don't think they need to. I don't think most consumers are ever going to know. It's going to be kind of like the Mission Impossible, Jason Bourne, we're going to save the planet and no one's going to know because industry is going to get our act together and all of a sudden the only choice for consumers will be the right choice. But that's my own. Keep recycling, keep doing all the right things, go <laughs> vegan, do all that. But just know that yeah, it's not all on consumers. Mark, yeah, I see you yeah, shaking I, your yeah, head. I, 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 I agree. And uh, I'm glad we agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> we got one, Mark. I didn't, I didn't know if we were going to. <laughs> uh, but first of all, I mean, there is value in Made in America. There is. And I was recently down in New Zealand, and I had a friend. He's a big cyclist. And he was telling me this story. He said, you know, I bought this bike, this bike pump. And so New Zealand has a weird supply chain because New Zealand is in the middle of nowhere, right? It's a three-hour flight from Australia, and then the next nearest landmass is Antarctica. So, you know, they have a weird supply chain. So they have very limited what they can get. So he, he said, I bought this bike pump from China. It was like $9. And he said, it broke in a year. So I went online. And, well, there it is again. Bought another one. Broke in a year. He said, and finally... I saw one that was made in America. It's the first time we had a made in America pipe pump available in New Zealand. It was $29, he said, and it's lasted for years. He said, I just knew I had to have made in America because I, I knew it was going to last. And that is a, that is a perception that persists uh, around the world. I think people do care. And, you know, the thing that I... Th I think it's just so new and and uh, a lot of the research still has to be done about what's going on right now because there is this enigma going on with with Gen Z where they say they care about sustainability and the environment and then they and then they support Shein and Timu, right? If you're not familiar with Shein, uh, it's the number one downloaded retail app in the world right now. They introduce uh, like 10,000 new products a day. And it's very cheap goods, but like you can buy a bikini for like $3. I'm not speaking from experience here. But, <laughs> uh, so I've been told that the, you know, and but here's really what's going on is that they, you know, they have this e-commerce thing going on where you're rewarded and you get more points for everything that you buy. And people will buy a $3 bikini. And even if it's terrible, who cares? It's $3. I'll just buy another one. And, 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 and so it's this fast fashion disposable economy. Now, one of the things that's going on and, you know, maybe there's a, a, a place there for, you know, for, for business and, and, and ma the manufacturing world to get behind this is, um, so there's a young woman that inspires me a lot. Her name is Sage Lanier. She was teaching a class on sustainability at, uh, I believe it was Stanford, when she was like 25 years old. And one of her messages is that Gen Z is woefully uneducated about the environment. They say they support the environment. And they said, she said, they have no idea what they're talking about. And her message is basically, look, the en environmental sustainability begins with the supply chain. It begins with what you choose to purchase and where that is coming from. And you can't do this fast fashion. Now, I don't, you know, and, and, and the reason I love her is because she is so passionate. She's in the, you know, she, she's getting a lot of media attention right now. But there is this disconnect. And again, as I said earlier, you know, I don't know if, um, if the reason that, that, that Gen Z seems to have this, uh, this strange view where they, they're so passionate about the environment, but they're not showing it. In their in their buying behavior, you know, I just don't know if they're there's you know they don't they really don't care they really don't understand or maybe they're young and they're broke. However, I did see a statistic that sort of made me wonder: the average age of a Shein consumer is 35. Oh. Wow! The average age of a Shein consumer is 35. So I mean, these are people that are basically making a decision to destroy the planet because it's the worst possible supply chain you could adopt. And, and the, there's, there's also a lot of controversy about their, their human rights 
uh, they're, they're, they've got people in sweatshops. They pay them $20 a day. If they miss their goal, they get docked $14 a day, and they're only making $20 a day, right? Wow. So, um, yeah, there's been a few documentaries about this. So, I mean, so it's just like, how can you possibly spend so much money and have to really push aside your values and everything that you say you, you believe in? And, you know, another, another part of it could be, um, you know, I, I heard this quote the other day that was really sad and profound, but I understand it. Um, so many of the you know, influencers out there, they're, they're doing unboxings from Shein. So they'll get a, they'll order, you know, twenty dollars worth of products from Shein, which means they got like a hundred things, and and then they'll unbox it and they'll say, oh look at this, I'm going to try it on, and and they, so, so they've come under a lot of criticism, and one of the one of the influencers says said sustainability is a luxury. Huh. Huh. Sustainability is a luxury, and and so I think you know, you have to have some empathy to people who, and, and this is what you said about, it was over and over your research said, people do not pay more, right? People do not, do not pay more. And um, if you can't pay more, especially if you can't pay more, um, then uh, th they're gonna feed their families. You know, they're gonna get low cost protein, they're gonna get low cost bikinis or whatever. <laughs> um, so we'll just have to see what happens with Gen, Gen Z culture? I mean, are they really going to walk the talk? Uh, or is it like, you know, Sage Lanier says, this is a woefully uneducated generation. And, you know, they, they think they're environmentalists. They preach sustainability. And they have no idea what they're talking about. So, go ahead. It's interesting that uh, consumers can't pay more, won't pay more, fair enough. Uh, the vast majority of Americans can't deal with a $500 surprise without going into debt. 90% is the number. Uh, so fair enough. If that's what you want to do, peace. I'll take it back to the supply chain. Uh, large companies can afford to pay more, and many actually do in their procurement uh, policies. Right now, they're including some element of transparency up the supply chain and responsible business practices. The challenge is when we remember how long our supply chains are, most supply chains can't see past their supplier's supplier. Most supply chains, 98% of supply chains, that's where it stops. So while we ask in good faith what something is happening up the supply chain, unfortunately, as we go up, uh, investments in technology go down, maturity goes down, uh, often oversight goes down, so we're in a real pickle. However, there is money being put towards those buying decisions, which depending on the research that you look at, is a far more impactful uh, amount of money and spending power in, inside of a supply chain. The challenge though is uh, if the supply chain is so important to sustainability or the Made in America discussion, most supply chain professionals are unaware of that. Um, there was a study a few years yeah. ago done on what uh, a, a couple of researchers are coining the supply chain economy, which shows that uh, there's 53 million people in America working in the supply chain. That spans from the boardroom to drivers and pickers in a warehouse. Uh, it's a generous definition, but I think it's an interesting paper. Uh, and if we think about that term then, we are a, a broadly un uh, contacted and unengaged audience. I give two keynotes right now, one on the circular supply chain and one on carbon flows through our supply chains. And I talk to people who've been supply chain professionals for 20 and 25 years, smart people who have no idea that supply chains produce 90% of a company's carbon emissions. Absolutely no idea. So we're the problem, but nobody's talked to us about it. We're the best problem solvers in the world. I truly believe we can solve for anything. You tell us what our constraints are, we'll find you a creative solution, but nobody's poise that to us. So I'm going to give one tiny plug, middle of the year, maybe around July, August time frame, um, our largest professional association called the Association for Supply Chain Management is putting out six one hour documentaries um, for the everyday person on supply chains. So you get to learn about the supply chain of your food, of electricity, of the internet, it's a physical place, of sports, uh, of clothing, and see some of the repercussions of fast fashion and when you drop off your items. At Goodwill, unfortunately, it usually doesn't actually end up 
at Goodwill, it ends up being shipped overseas. Uh, so anyway, that's my one plug, and hopefully that'll help to start span this gap. Yeah, I wanted to build on something that you that you said, and it, it reminded me that this idea of supply chain visibility is becoming a marketing trend. So if there's, uh, is there anybody buy from Everlane? Everlane? Okay. So Everlane um, really, I would say they, they emphasize sort of durable everyday clothes. You know, it's like the button down shirt and the black t-shirt, right? So, um, but they are, have, a, have complete transparency in their supply chain. So uh, they even have like videos of the, play, the, the, the shops in Asia where this is being made. They want people to see where it's being made, how it's being made. They show you the cost of each step in the supply chain. And then they also show this is how much profit we're making. And so this is becoming sort of a competitive advantage for them. So I think that's very interesting because that rolls into uh, human rights and it rolls into you know, sustainability and, it, and, and it, it shows, you know, we're being transparent to show, you know, how, you know this is how much we pay, pay our employees and this is how much profit we're taking. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting trend. I haven't seen it uh, really replicate in a lot of places yet, but they're one of my favorite brands because of, yeah. of that transparency. So listen, I, uh, I want to open it up to questions here in a few minutes. So think about your questions, get ready when we uh, start, just come up to the mic. But you're talking about a couple of things, uh, changes. And so there, uh, most companies are doing sustainability reports that go up to the Global Resources Initiative. You've got SASB standards. Um, so there are things that are helping drive this. What about government? First of all, is there anything the government is doing that's making it harder? Is there anything the government should do that would make this easier? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. We got four and a half minutes. Uh, a couple, a couple of areas. Look, it's interesting. Um, there's a lot of perspectives on the role of government, and that's um, what helps drive the discourse in America right now. But we can also look um, to other examples around the world to where government intervention uh, is helpful or not. Um, as we look at who is reshoring right now, it's around two key trends. Anything around EV batteries, uh, General Motors, for example, is uh, reigniting uh, production in Detroit really around EVs, um, and it's around chips. Because there is funding and some de-risking co-investment from the US government for big companies to come in and make multi-billion, multi-year bets. Um, maybe they could afford to do it on their own, but it's sort of a wooing game right now. Who's gonna bring you uh, what you need for the land underneath your uh, factory and so forth? Um, there are companies who never left. Um, Crayola, for example, has th thought about it many times that they've remained um, produ producing in America. There's a level of technology investment that's gonna be really important if we look overseas to something like um, France, Solomon Shoes. Um, is actually reshoring into France. They have reshored into France, but it's a fully automated warehouse. So then you start, or a factory. So then you start imagining, okay, there's not, there's some talent that's needed to make sure the robots all run, um, but you didn't really bring jobs, but you did bring uh, production back in. So uh, subsidies can be really helpful. Um, some regulations stand in the way. So if we think about the land of allowing a product to remain as itself for as long as possible, the perfect circular supply chain really doesn't exist. We take an item, we do nothing to it, and we have someone else pay us for it. It's a really good economic model. <laughs> Sometimes we need to like tweak it, quality inspect it, repair it, and then sell it to somebody else. And that uh, also makes us quite a bit of money and makes the buyer really happy because they save some money. Uh, this can work really well in something complicated like medical devices. But Philips has uh, just traditionally really been a leader in the space. And one of the examples they give is, look, a brand new MRI technology has come out. We've innovated the way we build this machine. So we want to give this MRI machine to somebody else. Uh, however, because it's in the medical industry, medical waste is considered hazardous waste. And hazardous waste can't cross borders, which is a good intent. We don't want to dump our, our bad stuff on some right. unsuspecting But even a medical country. device. Counts as medical waste. And wow. so we're not able to then gift um, some of these items to other areas. So there are some prohibitive laws. Thankfully, there's a lot of really good work happening through Europe. They can help kind of be our disruptors. There's a, they do have a Green New Deal and they have a circular economy um, working group and several directives that are coming out. So thankfully, we can kind of see what is and isn't working uh, and then hopefully take what does work and <laughs> leave what doesn't. Yeah. 
You know, the only thing I can I can really think about is the the, the manufacturing base that's going to change the world. I mean, if, if the ma if the manufacturers make the decision, and they're going to make that decision if there's pull from consumers, if this is something that's important. So if there was some sort of you know reunified effort around um, pride and made in America. I don't know if that's a government effort, but it could be a coalition kind of effort. Because there is, there is pride made in America. There is, across every generation, some stronger than others. Uh, and it, it, it made in America would lead to you know, a, a, a more resilient and, and smaller supply chain. So that, from a marketing standpoint, I think if you can uh, influence consumers to care about that, that's going to influence the manufacturers to care about that more. And that's really the, the influence, I think, that could make a difference. We do need to be cautious, though, of like America washing, because yeah. as the law right. says today, uh, especially when we think about subsidies for, I'll use battery circular supply chains, because yeah. there's some really interesting subsidies in place that say, look, if you go out and find a defunct EV battery, get the lithium out, or do anything to that battery at all and put it back on the market, your touch in America makes it now count as made. Yeah, there's got to be definition around that. Yeah, many of us really were proud of taking the U.S. made COVID vaccine, but it really <laughs> yeah. wasn't made here. The value was added overseas. We don't usually get into the dirty business of APIs, mm -hmm. the active pharmaceutical ingredient, because they're really, really dirty. That's primarily done by China. Ninety-five percent of the world APIs are made there, but. Uh, it was finished in America, uh, one of the vaccines. So then many people thought, well, I'm only going to do that because that was made in America. And so there also has, there's this going to be an America washing, mm -hmm. I think, that yeah. you could essentially, Shein could do everything to the bikini, bring it in and put the price tag on it here. Mm -hmm. And it would count depending yeah. on how we count it as made in America. So it becomes really important for us to truly shorten the supply chain, really understand how the sourcing works, really understand, and I will continue to advocate to not start from the planet every time. If we started from a bikini and made it into another bikini, wash it and whatever, even mm. though if it's $3, it might fall apart. Yeah. Um, but that's this really the idea, This is a very idea, interesting you know? product idea. Let's talk after <laughs> Perfect. Uh, but truly, if, if we make it easy on ourselves, if we repair something instead of building it brand new, there's less to keep track of. There's less visibility that we need to give to consumers. Um, and we're able to do that now if we think about the way that you get something repaired, although it's wildly overpriced usually. Um, but that's sort of how I spend my days is thinking about how do we make wide scale repair more accessible and available. So obviously an interesting, an interesting discussion. There's a lot that a lot of questions I still have, but I want to open it up to the audience. If anybody has any questions, please come up to the mic and let us know what you're thinking, what you want to know. Who's going to start the bikini repair <laughs> yeah. project? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk today. Um, you talked a lot about kind of the carrot approach with subsidies with Inflation Reduction Act, Chips and Science Act, uh, the uh, Infrastructure Act. What about the stick approach? Um, you know, we've seen more tariffs with China. Um, I'm just curious if you see how that's impacting supply chains already. From a import perspective, I can't speak to it. What I will say on the sustainability side is uh, visibility into our supply chains is starting to be taken quite seriously. Uh, the SEC has taken their time considering requiring supply chain visibility from companies, um, they've dropped that. But California kept it. So California has, uh, I think it's going to get challenged. But current, current state uh, is that they'll require uh, any company that makes over a billion dollars a year anywhere in the world and one dollar in California uh, needs to report on their upstream supply chain as far as scope three emissions is concerned. So it doesn't really matter what it is that we need to report on. If we need visibility, we need visibility. That impacts uh, 5,400 companies. Uh, so that remains in place, and California is a huge economy, so it impacts the majority of who would have been impacted by the SEC anyway. Uh, and several regulations through Europe require similar type of visibility. Um, currently on the material side, it's the high carbon materials, but I suspect that will expand. It includes batteries. Um, but there's also this uh, idea of due diligence around our supply chains on more of the, the human impact side, which is unbelievably difficult for supply chains to get a hold of um, because people lie. So materials are somewhat easy. We can do spot checks. We can like molecularly tag 
materials to track them through a supply chain. But uh, human beings show up and use each other's IDs and do all kinds of stuff to not be who they say they are in our operation. So it's unbelievably difficult, but we are seeing some uh, foundation. I wouldn't say there are sticks yet with uh, scope three, for example. Um, I suspect it will take another two years for us to see maybe three, the tariffs coming through from the EU, but they're gonna be very, very hefty to inspire two actions. One, um, to make sure that those products, wherever they're made, are made uh, more responsibly. But two, I think will inspire a circular materials marketplace inside the EU. If you never cross a border, you don't pay the tax, and the way to not cross the border is you just keep it inside the borders. And I think that could be an interesting one for us to look at here. Uh, I understand several years ago, the US Chamber of Commerce commissioned a study to figure out if there is uh, viable sets of materials that we could exchange among our own manufacturing. And they did find uh, 13 different families of materials that would economically be viable to be shared. The problem is that no one is incentivized to lead. So this coordination function doesn't exist, so I will make no additional money if I sit here and, and coordinate regionally. Um, but that's not a stick either, that's just a missed opportunity. So I don't know of any, Mark, maybe you know better. No. So I'll tell you one of the problems with the stick is it gets to be very complex and you get unintended consequences when you move too quickly. Uh, so one of the things that's going on with the tariffs right now, a lot of nearshoring of electronics has happened, friend shoring with Mexico, which is great. Except when you start digging into the supply chain, where are those products coming from? They're coming from China. They just found a different way around it. We have a number of examples like that, especially on electronics. It's very complex. So I know a lot of people believe that there are sticks that would work, but to get those figured out correctly so we don't have unintended consequences, that's really challenging. I think you'll see more of it, but we need to get it right. You see somebody else standing up over here? Um, so I've got a little bit of a different view on this, I have to tell you. People aren't going to pay more, and I agree with you in the middle. You've got younger people who don't have the dollars to pay more. You've got older people on fixed income who aren't going to pay any more. So this whole idea of buying America and tariffs and all those other things they're talking about from a political standpoint is going to make inflation go through the roof. And that's the second most important thing to the voter today is inflation. I would rather go back to the view, and, and the other part I'd have to it is, who's going to make this with an unemployment rate as low as we've got today? Mm, yeah. So I think a flexible supply chain that has more than one entry, to me, is a much better solution set than trying to bring it all in-house and not have the flexibility in the end, and not even sure if you can make it to be kind of who's going who's to build it. You know, what's funny is, uh, in the same time that Jack Welsh was figuring out this uh, center of excellence in India, he also said what would be the best is if we could put all of our factories on barges <laughs> and move them around the world depending on tariffs and what's going on in politics. That would be the best possible, he said this 25 years ago. So it's, <laughs> uh, and I think that's definitely, that's still the case. It's unbelievably expensive and complex to pick up and drop down a factory. Again, because of all these tiers, it's not like it's just one factory. It's a factory in an entire ecosystem of all those suppliers, suppliers that build up. And we see these mega cities building up around uh, how we manufacture our items. That said, I believe we will get to a point um, where we can commoditize some portion of the way that we make our items so that we can have more shared resources that are produced in market. Um, there are some companies exploring this. Unilever has taken an entire food production line and put it in a 40-foot shipping container, maybe to prove that it's possible. It is. Uh, and so we could imagine that they come into Austin, plop it down, they produce for a few days, it's everything that Austin needs for that month, and they, they take it away again. 5G technology, it was a big deal a couple years ago, of course, enables us to do something like produce in transit. So we can put a little teeny tiny factory inside one of these containers uh, and build in transit, which I think is really interesting. Um, we actually see this used by um, Pfizer and BioNTech. They, they needed six shipping containers, but they were able to put uh, an entire COVID vaccine production line uh, across these six containers to take it into resource constrained environments to poorer countries in order to get them access to these items. And so it's possible to do. I think it will happen. It's gonna be a bumpy road. Some industries it's just not gonna 
be possible to do, and semiconductors is one that's gonna be tough to put inside a tiny little shipping container because the machines needed are really huge. Um, but I do think so for some of our consumer goods, um, I'm, I'm hopeful and I see the building blocks to be able to take it that direction. I don't know if it's gonna come because of consumers. I hope it will become a, a good business strategy for supply chains to understand that they can react to the needs of a marketplace much easier and eventually we'll be able to source materials from that city for use inside that city and create these little ecosystems and that's my vision for the future. I always say it's like 10 years from now, it's gonna be like 40 years from now, but I believe it'll be in our future and we'll be living in Star Trek soon enough with replicators and it's gonna be a great world. And, and I, I mean, if there was any confusion at all, I mean, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying that the pressure should be on consumers. You know, I'm not saying we should say, you know, pay more. Uh, the, that's the, you know, the, the pressure has to be on the manufacturers and the, and the supply chain. And I also think this idea of, of the diversity of America is a strength here. And because you think you know, China doesn't want diversity. They don't want immigrants, they don't want diversity. A lot of the countries don't, even Western Europe. And by having diversity and, you know, and a, if we can have an immigration policy that works, that could fuel a lot of the transformation that we need to have. That's a strength of America. You know, I mean, everybody, you know, China and Japan fight for homogeneity and we celebrate diversity. Yep. And that's, that, that's a strength, you know, that's a strength of America. That, that's what will, will keep us number one in the end, I think. And by the way, there was a study that came out last year. Every single country in the world has a workforce deficit. Every single country except India. India is the only country with a workforce surplus, which I thought was very interesting. Paul. Yes, hi. I'd like to ask a, a bit of a, a controversial question, if I could. Would that be okay? <laughs> we um, like controversy. Yeah, so the U.S. has 5% of the world's population. And um, so take zippers, for example. So zippers are made by YKK in Taiwan and others in Asia, it's essentially all the world's zippers. And they have huge factories, and they sell, you know, to all the countries. So if the U.S. decides to bring zippers back and has one zipper company that is 5% of the world's supply, and that zipper company has a problem, the factory has a problem, we run out of zippers. Um, now, the earlier gentleman said a flexible supply chain, but... I'm all for Made in America, Chris knows. I've started a semiconductor manufacturing company and we won't survive if there's not some protection and, and, and some, so I'm all for it, but I just wanted to kind of raise an intellectual question to see if anybody's thought of the frailty that reshoring could introduce with so small of a um, percentage of the I think one idea behind resilient is not putting all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Yeah, we typically try not to get all of our items from one supplier anyway, uh, but it's a valid point. So if we wanted to be able to have an entire ecosystem inside of our country, we need to make sure the resilience is there, we have more than one option, we have fallback plans. And again, I totally believe that we can use the zippers that have already been made to put into new clothing, right? We've made a hell of a lot of zippers. Uh, and there's a lot going to landfill right now, uh, to, to use the zipper example, but that could translate then into really any product line, so this idea that we have to manufacture from scratch just doesn't have longevity. It just isn't the way that we're going to continue to work. Uh, we're actually running out of the resources inside the planet that we know of. There may be big swaths of gold laying around somewhere, but to date we have less than 50 years left to mine uh, all the gold that we know of in the planet. Um, which is really rather important for the way that we run the economies and our electronics. Uh, so we're now learning to uh, mine e-waste in a much more practical and cost-effective way than we tried to 10 years ago when it was declared cost prohibitive. Um, Apple's even trained two little robots to take apart iPhones and take out the teeny tiny little specks of gold to put it into new iPhones. iPhone 13 was the first one to be made with fully reclaimed gold. So I still believe that we don't have to be a single source type of uh, setup, especially if we consider every major city to be the source of materials and we imagine micro factories laying around in these urban centers. Uh, it doesn't work for the middle part of America, of course, the density is just not enough to do that, but we certainly could produce for ourselves and ship through. I don't know of a way that we're ever gonna be fully self-sufficient, 
Um, but it's an interesting thought exercise for supply chains to sit down and, and imagine what if we needed to be, um, and what would that take, and what's the ecosystem that we would need to bring along. So we've been down this road before. We, we've ebbed and flowed the, the made in America, bring everything here, and then go back. Uh, a lot of you probably remember the look for the union label campaign from a long time ago. And that wasn't successful. It feels different this time. It feels like there might be the right things coming together, like you were talking about, some of the examples you brought up. Is it, it are things different this time? Is it, could this time around stick? The thing that encourages me is that I, 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 I'm sort of obsessed with uh, Gen Z. <laughs> <laughs> they just, they punch above their weight in, in taste and culture. And I'm convinced that purpose and meaning really do matter to them. And that they eventually, that uh, a company, a product that aligns with their values will, will succeed, will work. It will transcend you know, you know, everything, everything else. So I do think something's different this time. I really do. I, I, I think you know, right now, you know, I, I think there's like mixed messages about you know, how they're buying from Sheen or, or whatever, but you know, I, I've, I've been to you know, events, I've, I, I teach students, I had a really, really interesting conversation. Uh, I did a, I was teaching in an MBA, I teach at Rutgers. I was teaching in, a, in an MBA class and, and they took me to the mat because you know, I said, look, you know, if, if you're broke, you're, you're not gonna buy a more expensive product because it's environmentally sustainable. They said, yes, we will. You don't know us. <laughs> they would not relent. They would not relent. Now again, you know, what do they really do? But I, I, I mean, I, I do think, and, I, and it's not just my observations. I mean, the research shows that this is a generation that is convinced they can really change the world. And if, if this becomes uh, their, I mean, the environment is everything to them. That's you know, by far the, the number one issue. And it, it, in terms of how that connects to uh, a smaller supply chain, more resilient supply chain, then they will care about it and they will fight for it. So, I mean, I do think that is, that, that is different. There is, there's this passion, meaning and purpose really does matter to this, to this generation. From a supply chain perspective, there's a couple of, of elements that I do think feel different enough. Um, and the same that I had mentioned before, particularly around the disruptability and the need to be risk focused for supply chains. One of my first meetings I ever went to as a professional when I started my career at Microsoft, one of my, my first day, one of my first meetings I went to was um, the leaders of all the functional areas of distribution and logistics and manufacturing all got together to review their disaster recovery plan which was a 150 page document that was printed out physically and put in a drawer somewhere. Um, they're very good at managing their supply chains now. This is a long time ago, so don't get me in trouble with Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. they're very resilient. Uh, actually one of the world's leading supply chains. Um, but it, it occurred to me the way that we manage risk. In today's world, uh, technology has advanced so far that we can listen to our supply chains, that, that we can get computers to listen to our supply chains and figure out what might go wrong. We have them listen to social media to figure out if a Kardashian sister will prefer rose gold or blue. And our supply chains go nuts, they break because somebody made a, a, a tweet or a comment or looked at something differently. And our supply chains can now watch all of that to try to figure out how we can possibly meet that demand on time. And so I think the level of technology that we have uh, accessible now, happily many of the hyperscalers are using renewable energy because many of these algorithms are very, very energy hungry. Um, but we can listen more than we ever have, we can predict more than we ever have, we can shape more than we ever have. And I think if we can really come to the table and start shaping the demand, and you, you don't realize that if, if you buy from Amazon, you've been part of this, they will not put at the top of the page something that's out of stock. Um, they're shaping what you want by the results that you see because they're gonna only sell you what they actually have. 
which is a brilliant move. It sounds really straightforward, but it's actually really difficult to pull off. So I think the technology is in an unbelievably sophisticated space. Material science is doing really cool stuff, looking up something called biofacturing, biomanufacturing, where we grow our materials instead of mine it from the planet. Uh, it's estimated that we can do that for 60% of the materials that we need to run our society can be grown with biology instead of mined out of the planet. That's really good news for us. Um, and so we're disruptable. We have really cool technology, and we've got good material science. And pretty soon, Gen Z is, are going to start being promoted <laughs> into director levels inside our supply chains, the more hungry, career-focused ones, um, which we'll see if they end up that way. They're unbelievably loyal to their own values and will uh, quit if something happens uh, to, today, if there's something happens in the news about their supply chains. And, right, I do, so we, and I do think, and I only say this in half jest, that the topic for South by Southwest for next year should be the Kardashian sensitive supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so listen, we have a minute and a half here. 15 seconds. Give the audience your thought on what should they do? What should be the one action item that they take from here they think about when they leave? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's hard for individuals, I think, to really impact this in a, in a meaningful way, other than to be really aware of uh, the supply chain implications, the environmental implications of what you do. Truly, I think a lot of change in our world starts with your pocketbook. It starts with your purchase decisions. Get really curious about where your favorite items come from. Um, even for supply chain professionals, it's almost impossible to track our items all the way back to the planet. But go be curious and find out and ask questions and look at your labels and read where something might be made and look at their websites and see if you can find out. And if not, take the 10 seconds to ask, where was this made? How was it made? Please send me information. And teach your kids about it. Yeah. So, so for me, as I was thinking about this before, it was going to be educate and empower. And I was thinking about you know, your team, your employees. This week, it became glaringly obvious to me you need to educate leadership. If you're in business, you need to educate your leadership because they do not understand a lot of these issues that have been discussed here today. A big thank you to the audience. You've been great. Thank you to ATI. Thank you to the production team. Really appreciate your help in all this. Z, thanks for the invitation. Thank you.